Our scripture for today is Numbers 9, 15 through 23. On the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant, and from evening until morning it was over the tabernacle, having the appearance of fire. It was always so, the cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud covered from one over the tent, the Israelites would set out, and in place where they could settle down, the Israelites would camp. At the command of the Lord, the Israelites would set out, and at the command of the Lord, they would camp. As soon as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they would remain in camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle for many days, the Israelites would keep the change of the Lord and would not set out. Sometimes the cloud would remain for a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they would remain in camp. Then, according to the command of the Lord, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud would remain from evening until morning, and when the cloud lifted in the morning, they would set out. Or, if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they would set out. When it was days or a month or a longer time, the cloud continued over the tabernacle, resting upon it, the Israelites would remain in the camp and would not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. At the command of the Lord, they would camp. And at the command of the Lord, they would set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Don't you all want Carrie Farr to record an entire version of him reading the Bible? Or a bedtime story, maybe, of just some kind of book that makes you want to curl up by the fire or something like that? Thank you for reading for us this morning, Carrie. Um, one order of business uh, for those of us who are here in person and for those of us who are worshiping online, you are going to want the handouts that were um, on the outside when you came in. And if you didn't grab one, my very best friend in the whole wide world, Dina Hyatt, will get you one if you raise your hand. Dina gets really mad when I mention her from the pulpit. Um, but ushers, if a couple of you can help uh, get the handouts to a couple of folks that uh, have them, I just have a feeling we're going to want to have them in front of us today. Um, and for those of you who are online, the discussion guides can be found at creekwoodumc.org slash stigma free. Um, and if you click on week two's discussion guide, that's where you'll find the important information for today. So folks, if you'll keep your hands up, I know there's a couple of our usher types that are working on that to come help you. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, helping out with that for us. So I love to learn. I love being surprised by things that I didn't know beforehand and then knowing them. I love researching how um, concepts have come to be and how they've changed over time. I genuinely love hearing about how other people think, even if it's not how I think. And this week I got the chance to sit inside of a Tesla and I got to learn all about how electric cars work and how this car basically runs on an iPad, and you can watch Netflix in it. It's fast. I have not been surprised by technology in a while, and I was surprised by the Tesla. But one of the things that I love most about learning is what I call unlearning. In my very short life so far, there are already words and phrases and habits that I as an individual have had to unlearn. That way I can give words their true meaning. That way I can be welcoming and inclusive to the people around me. And I can be more aware of the experiences that others have. 
I've had to unlearn language that I use around topics like race and people with disabilities and even gender. And I am better for the times that I have unlearned something. And so part of this journey through uh, walking through our mental health care is going to involve some unlearning, I think, for most of us today. If you've known me for more than about 10 minutes, you know that I am a highly anxious person. I firmly believe that God created my brain to be a little bit more anxious than others because God has given me this gift of, of asking questions and the gift of thinking of the worst case scenario, and sometimes the gift of worrying in the short term about all kinds of situations. Though I'm often made fun of for being this way, and I'll be the first to admit I'm not always in the best control of it, there are times where my high anxiety serves me as a gift. Because I'm a highly anxious person that is always seeking out the worst case scenario, I'm the type of person you want around if there's an emergency. I'm not shocked by something going wrong because I've already thought about the other 14 ways that the situation could have gone wrong in the first place and what I would do about it. So today's sermon is about anxiety. And you can rest assured today that you are hearing from a person who experiences it constantly. And friends, the first thing that I want us to unlearn today is this. Anxiety is not a bad thing. In fact, anxiety is created by God. Anxiety is the normal response that, a, that your brain makes to dangerous or stressful situations. Anxiety is that feeling we get when something around us is supposed to make us anxious. Maybe when you were a kid, you would get anxiety about a big test in school. Or some of you in here might have felt anxious before you proposed to your spouse. Maybe you felt anxious right before an interview for a job. Or maybe you've been anxious when you've been walking around in the dark at night. Or for some of you that like to go to things like haunted houses or crazy attractions, those things cause anxiety to happen. I felt anxious a few minutes ago when I was sitting right there before I got up in the pulpit. Anxiety is not a bad thing. Strong and healthy, normal working brains are anxious. If you experience anxiety when situations call for it, your brain is acting in the way that God created it to work. Evolutionarily speaking, anxiety is our brain's way of alerting us that something dangerous might be around, and your body is responding to that alert. Anxiety is not a bad thing. There are times when I've heard us say, well, well, my friend has been diagnosed with anxiety, or I've been diagnosed with anxiety, as if anxiety is a medical diagnosis that is wrong, but it's something our brain is supposed to have. You can't be diagnosed with something that's normal. Anxiety is not a bad thing. Strong and healthy and normal working brains have anxiety. What we need to watch out for, and what we are usually talking about that is diagnosed medically, is an anxiety disorder or imbalance. When we talk about someone having more anxiety than normal, we are talking about an anxiety disorder or imbalance. I purchased a copy of the Diagnostic and Statistical Man Manual of Mental Disorders, we're going to call it the DSM. Um, and this is what you can find um, in therapist's office, and it's been updated about five times since its first evolution. And my version that I found at Half Price Books is not the most recent. It's one version back, but it contains 12 different categories of anxiety disorders a person might be diagnosed with if their brain has an imbalance of anxiety beyond the normal levels. Because anxiety is not a bad thing. Strong 
and healthy and normal brains have anxiety. So what happens on the inside of our brains when we experience normal and abnormal levels of anxiety? When we experience anxiety, there's lots of things that are happening in the brain. And today, we're going to turn our focus to the limbic system. And that's that second layer of the brain. If you were here last week, I talked about um, the brain being developed in layers. So the limbic system is the second layer. And we've got this slide for my visual learners in the room. So we're going to talk about some of the different parts of the limbic system. So the first is the hypothalamus, which is a really cool word to use at your next cocktail party. Um, this is in the limbic system, and this is the part of your brain that controls um, your basic functions that help your brain with the process of homeostasis. Now, I want us to all go back in our brains to fifth grade science, and some of you in here are in the fifth grade, so go to fifth grade science. The functions that, of our body that move us to equilibrium or baseline normal are done by the hypothalamus. So here's an example. It's Texas, and we're in the month of July. So when you go outside, and it's 104 degrees with 10,000% humidity, and the sun is shining directly upon you, what does your body do to maintain homeostasis? Sweat! Yes! That is your body, that is your hypothalamus alerting your body, hey, it's too hot out here, we're going to sweat to cool us down. So that's what the hypothalamus does. So the second you see is the hippocampus. This is where um, memories are housed. And it, you see it's, it's really deep in um, the brain. It's housed really deep in that temporal lobe. Um, this is where memories sit. And then the last part is the amygdala. This is the base of the limbic system. And the amygdala is where all kinds of emotions are stored and where they're given meaning. We used to think that the amygdala only held the emotion of fear, but newer studies have shown that all emotions are stored and given meaning and converted in the amygdala. So, when you're experiencing normal anxiety that strong and healthy and created by God brains are supposed to have, these three work together. The amygdala receives information from a part of the body that there is a stressful situation happening. The hypothalamus receives that information and the process to get to equilibrium via homeostasis begins. And when the situation is over, the hippocampus stores the memories if necessary. In case that situation might come up again, the brain already knows what to do. And so if you're experiencing anxiety, that means these three parts of your brain are working the way that they are supposed to work. When someone has an anxiety disorder or an imbalance, something might not be working right with these three parts of the limbic system and the rest of the body. Look at how small those pieces are in your brain. With all of these highways of, of neurons that um, are going on in your brain and throughout your body, it's no wonder that some of us might have an anxiety disorder or imbalance. An anxiety disorder or imbalance is nothing to be ashamed of. It just means that your brain is working a little bit differently. A lot of the time I get asked by... Um, people who don't experience as much anxiety as I do, well, how can I help when you're anxious? So I want to show us a slide of two brain scans. The one on the left is a normal functioning brain. And you can see all the areas that are lit up are the areas of the brain in the scan um, that, are, that are working, that are doing something. The brain on the right is a brain having a panic attack which is the most extreme, sudden rush of anxiety that takes over the brain and the body. The brain that is having a panic attack is not as lit up as the normal brain, right? And so friends, when we experience an imbalance of anxiety or a panic attack, sometimes there are parts of our brain that are simply 
shut down and do not work. Sometimes we do not have complete control over our bodies. And so I want to say something very clear from the pulpit today. One of the worst things that you can do to a person who has higher levels of anxiety is to tell them to calm down. Because sometimes that's not within the realm of possibility for someone who is overly anxious or having a panic attack. When your brain shuts down, there's nothing to guide your body along the way of what to do next. So when I hear this specific passage from Numbers, I can't help but wonder what kinds of regular anxiety and anxiety imbalances or disorders might have been present with the newly freed, wandering in the wilderness Israelite people. Obviously, there was no language for these medically at the time. But can you imagine living a life that is so mobile and unpredictable as the Israelite people, not knowing what was going to happen tomorrow or which way was going to be the right way to go or what was coming next. One of the things that I want you to remember about the book of Numbers that I said last week, and if you get nothing else from this sermon series, I hope you get this from the book of Numbers. God pays attention. So let's talk about the cloud and the fire. This passage from Numbers 9 is one of my very favorite stories in the entire Bible. There are lots of uh, small intricacies that we might miss if we just read it and say, oh, they followed a cloud and it turned to fire at night. So let's talk about the cloud. A cloud is often represented as the presence of God in the Old Testament. But that's not just stuck to, um, to Judaism or Judeo-Christian. Um, in other stories in the ancient Near East, people's gods appear to them in clouds or like clouds. We see that God appears like a cloud in Psalms, in the book of Job, in Nahum, in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, 1 Kings, and even in the New Testament. In Revelation, when John is having a dream, God appears in the presence of a what? A cloud. The other thing to notice here is that the cloud never goes away. It doesn't dissolve when the Israelites land in a stopping place, but instead it, it goes over to the tabernacle, it goes over to the holiest place in the entire camp, and it stays to let them know that that's where they're going to stay. God pays attention. The presence of God is always with the people. And don't miss this, even when things get dark, as they tend to do out in the desert with no street lights, the presence of God stays with the people. And it becomes visible at night because it becomes this pillar of fire. I have to wonder if the fire reminded Moses of what he saw with the burning bush that was on fire but not burning up when he was given the instructions that started this whole journey on the first place. The fire sits over the holiest place in the camp. And so I have to imagine that it's fire, it's dark outside, it's kind of the only thing that everyone can see. God pays attention. And the presence of God is always with the people. The presence of God dwells even in the thick darkness. What I think is really important to see here with the fire and the cloud is this. God has not left the Israelite people. The presence of God was here on earth through their entire journey through the wilderness. There is no separation in this moment between heaven and earth, even when the people are wandering with no place to call home. And so what I love about this scripture that we see in the book of Numbers is that the people of Israel, they follow the rhythm of the presence of God. 
When the cloud stays, they stay. When it moves, they move. And even in the darkness, God's presence remains with them. When we experience times of normal, heightened, imbalanced anxiety, and even if some of us are diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, God's presence remains with us. When the amygdala fires and triggers that involuntary fight, flight, or freeze response in our body, God's presence remains with us. And I believe that God gives us reminders of God's presence to help us manage our anxiety at normal and abnormal levels. God has a rhythm that each of us is to follow with God, just like the Israelite people followed the cloud when it moved. And so I'm going to share with you all my cloud and my fire that I have that God has given me to follow the rhythm of my times of heightened anxiety and generalized anxiety disorder. The first of these is therapy. Now, you maybe heard me slightly mention last week that my therapist is helping me write the discussion guides that you have for each uh, sermon to take home or to do with your family or your friends or your small group. So in case you missed it, I go to therapy. In fact, I'm not afraid to say I go to therapy regularly. I went two days ago. I've been going to therapy at least once a month, sometimes more, since January of 2017. There are times where I've had a major crisis or a traumatic event, and I am so glad I am regularly in therapy. There are times where I am processing events from my past and even my childhood, and I am so glad that I am in therapy. There are times where things are smooth sailing. There's not much going on that's wrong or disturbing. And even then, I am so glad that I am in therapy. Having a doctor who you see regularly for checkups on your mental health care is just as important as all the other doctors that you see regularly for checkups on your dental, cardiac, feminine, and general health. If therapy is something that you find useful to help manage your anxiety, but it's not helping at the level it needs to, you might need to be prescribed medication to help with your anxiety that's going to be your cloud or your fire. And there's a lot of things I want heard loud and clear today, and this is another one. There is no shame in needing medication to help you balance imbalanced anxiety or an anxiety disorder. God created science and God created medicine to be used by certified doctors to help our bodies do what they need to do. Anti-anxiety medication helps our brains get to a normal level so that we can deal with the situations that life is throwing at us. Now, I do want this to be heard loud and clear today, too. Medicine does not do the work for you. It gets you to a level so that you can do the work. And so because of this, I would recommend that if anyone is um, on medication for anxiety, you also need to be seeing a therapist just to make sure that everything is working the way that it needs to work on a regular basis. Just like if you have a heart problem and you're prescribed medication for that, you're going to have checkups with your cardiologist to make sure that that medicine is doing its job. God has given you and God has given me therapy and medication that can be a cloud or a pillar of fire to help guide us through the rhythm of our life. The second thing that I use to help manage my anxiety when it's out of balance is I talk to people I trust. It's no surprise that I um, am a verbal processor. When I'm experiencing times of heightened anxiety, I have to talk about it. This is why God created me to be a preacher. I'm very good at talking. 
I have some really incredible friends and mentors in my life that know me well, and they know the highly anxious parts of me too. When I'm experiencing times or situations that cause heightened anxiety, I talk to these people. These are people that take my phone call anytime, no matter what's going on. These are people that never tell me to calm down, like I mentioned earlier. These are people who sit with me, who acknowledge that the anxiety, though sometimes not always grounded in logic, the feeling of it is real. They listen to me if I need to talk. And the best part is they never judge me for being highly anxious about something. God has given you and God has given me trusted people who act like a cloud and in times of darkness, a pillar of fire that help guide us in the rhythm of life. The last thing that I currently find helpful to manage my anxiety is the balance I find in the feelings wheel. So this is where you need your handout. You should have one that has a feelings wheel. We've got one up on the screens too. If you're watching online, you can go to creekwoodumc.org slash stigma free so that you can find this as well. So the feelings wheel, I love this thing. I discovered it about a year ago um, and I have a sticker of it on my laptop. Um, that pillow that Pastor Katrina used, that sits in my office. Anytime you want to come hang out and use the feelings wheel, it's always there. When it comes to anxiety and un other aspects of mental health care, a lot of experts say you only get better if you know what you feel and feel what you feel. The feelings wheel helps us identify what we are feeling on more than one level. So on the inside wheel, you'll see um, the six inner emotions that are easily identified. And if you've seen the movie Inside Out, these um, six emotions are part of that, right? Those are the main characters. And we're going to be watching that with Family Ministries here in a couple of weeks. And we're going to have a discussion guide for that movie as well. But those six inner emotions are the inside wheel. And so um, this is where you start when you have the feelings wheel. You identify out of the six what you're feeling. And then you move to the outer two layers to help you identify and explain in more specific terms this, the feeling that you are having. So for example, I want you to take your wheel and start with the inner emotion of fear. If we move to the second wheel, we see that there are different ways of describing fear, like scared, terrified, insecure, nervous, horrified. And the outer layer, that third layer, has even more ways of describing fear. I love the wheel because it helps me really nail down and put appropriate language to what I am feeling. Because insecure and horrified are not always the same feelings. And knowing what we are feeling can help us better manage a stressful situation. Friends, God has given us the feelings wheel to act like a cloud or even in the times of the thick darkness, um, a pillar of fire to help guide us through the rhythm of life. When we are anxious, the best thing to remember is that it is normal. When we experience anxiety, we must know that our brain is doing exactly what it is supposed to do. Strong and healthy brains experience anxiety just as God created them to do so. When we experience anxiety, the best thing to do is not to, to put it away, but to acknowledge it, experience it, and find healthy ways to deal with it. God has provided things in our lives to help us follow the rhythm of wandering in the wilderness. And even though I was only able to name three, if I had more time, I could name you 20 things that God gives us 
like a cloud and in the thick darkness like a pillar of fire to help us navigate the rhythm of life. I sincerely hope this week you might find the time to see the cloud and if you're in the thick darkness, the pillar of fire that might be right above you, that might be residing in a holy place that might be so evident that everyone can see it. When it moves, you move. When it stays, you stay. And know that the presence of God dwells with you, both in the light and in the thick darkness. Let's pray. Gracious and most loving God, we thank you for our brains for the ways that you created our brains to respond to keep us safe. God, we thank you for the things that we unlearn so that we can be better. We thank you for the ways in which our brain makes us anxious so that we are safe. God, we thank you for doctors and for medication and for friends and for the feelings wheel that helps us when we have an imbalance of anxiety or an anxiety disorder. God, help us to be brave to continue to talk about the things of mental health that are so unspeakable in our circles so that we eliminate the stigma. Help us to be brave to talk about mental health with our children and other children that might be in our sphere of influence so that they don't grow up knowing a stigma. God, we thank you for the things in our life that are like a cloud and the things that stay in the darkness like the pillar of fire. Help us to open our eyes to see your presence dwelling among us. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen.